So much suspense. You ready? So I think we are live. Uh, welcome everyone to the fifth lecture with the student presentation. Uh, today we'll have two presentations. Uh, so we will live stream both of them. So be ready for those on YouTube. Uh, for today, we will start with Jacob. Joel is going to introduce him. Uh, so the stage is yours, thanks. Great, thanks, Mohammed. So hi, everyone. Today, we will have Jacob Mandula. He's a fourth semester, master semester student in electrical engineering. His uh, specialization and the research interest is low power machine learning. And uh, he will present a paper about the fourth generation of the Google Tensor Processing Units from ISCA 2021. And maybe you notice some interesting things in the paper, how differently uh, industry can approach such papers. So good luck, Jakub. Thank you, Joel. So hello, everybody. Uh, today, I'm going to be presenting you uh, this paper, um, which gives you a more of a industrial perspective, as Joel has mentioned on what goes on in a um, Google TPU team, what is their thought process in designing uh, new hardware architectures, and how do they learn from their past mistakes, from their past uh, revisions in order to improve uh, in the future. So let's start with uh, the executive summary. So as you are probably all aware these days, uh, we all, all want to have uh, fancy AI uh, applications running in our phones and everything. Um, however, these uh, applications continuously change and their training and the inference is quite expensive. Uh, so Google being a huge AI company really um, desires flexible, cost-effective and scalable um, hardware, which is able to perform these, um, these tasks. And the idea in this paper is to document, um, well, identify and document uh, some of the lessons they have learned uh, designing previous versions of the TPU chips and leverage the improvements in technology that we have seen to bring, for example, the memory closer to the processing elements, exploiting uh, some compiler optimizations or um, um, improving or uh, expanding computational units wherever appropriate to um, get better results. And as you can see from the results, um, they are getting about a 2.3 uh, improvements of performance per TDP or the, the power, the uh, thermal dissipation power compared to their previous uh, versions using only about 1.6 times as many transistors. Um, and also they're uh, faster than, for example, the competing NVIDIA T4 um, while having about the same uh, performance per TDP. Uh, what am I going to be talking about in, the, in this um, in this presentation. Now, I'll give you a quick background on what is actually a TPU. I'll give you a summary of the 10 lessons uh, that have been mentioned in this paper. I will show you how these 10 lessons have um, shaped the design of the latest TPU version 4. Um, I'll show you some quick um, performance evaluations that the, the team has performed. And then we can look at some of the strengths and weaknesses of the paper and some of the insights that I have that I think were quite valuable uh, to take away and that we can learn from this paper. And then hopefully we'll have time for some interesting discussion. So what is a TPU? So TPU stands for Tensor Processing Unit, and it's a specialized uh, um, domain-specific architecture. Um, the TPUs uh, designed by, uh, these TPUs are designed by Google in-house, and they are designed to perform uh, various AI um, workloads, such as convolution, matrix multiplication, or activation evaluation, however, extremely efficiently. So um, essentially, you have a um, host PC which streams a problem um, into the local memory of the TPU. Um, and then the TPU uses specialized hardware called matrix multiply units to work locally on this memory to uh, perform the processing. And then the host picks up this, uh, the answers. Um, Google has developed both uh, training and inference chips. However, their latest TPU version 4 is actually uh, primarily focused on inference. 
And here you see in this table a uh, evolution or summary of the evolution um, of their uh, TPU versions. And as you can see, um, with improving technology over the time, they were, of course, able to cram in more transistors uh, and also increase the, the clock rate. But um, also the, the memory size has gradually increased on chip. However, if you look very closely, you might notice that, for example, the memory bandwidth has actually dropped in the latest uh, technology or in the latest uh, TPU version. And also uh, the increasing trend of uh, increasing the, the, the system's TDP has uh, braked rapidly and dropped all the way to 175 watts. And the number of cores has also been decreased. So you might be asking yourself, like, why we want to have fast, uh, fast AI, why are we decreasing the power? Uh, well, hopefully some of the lessons that I, I will present to you will sort of give you a hint why the team has developed to completely change strategies and go this path. So uh, some of the, I'll give you a quick summary of the 10 uh, lessons. They can be kind of split into these three categories. So let's start with um, some general lessons that applied to almost any kind of silicon design. Uh, so probably even you could benefit from this. And the first one is um, that logic wires and uh, memory don't improve uh, equally. And as you can see in this updated uh, famous Horowitz uh, operation per or energy per operation table, um, when you look at the improvements for the, for the technological jump, for, the, um, uh, for, for some of the logical uh, computations, so additions and multiplications, the improvements are much better than those for, uh, for example, SRAM or the DRAM. So uh, in effect, effectively, any kind of logic that you add to your chip is relatively free. Uh, so if you can improve your performance by adding more transistors, more logical transistors, go for it. An example of this is, for example, the high bandwidth memory. Uh, which essentially places uh, DRAM stacks very close to the to the chip and connects it to the core with a high bandwidth bus, and this gives you a much better um, much better a much better efficiency compared to, for example, standard DRAM chips. So, use uh, logic where possible. Number two is leveraging prior compiler optimizations. So. Um, Compilers improve continuously. Um, mature compilers only slowly, but as you can see in the graph, um, we have we can you can see that um, for example the CUDA compiler from NVIDIA and also the Google TPU XLA compiler has over a 20 month period improved almost doubled in in performance. This is essentially free performance that you are getting uh, continuously. And if you really want to exploit it, you should your hardware should uh, stay compatible with with um, with the compiler. Uh, also, a lot of these optimizations come only after uh, hardware is released to the compiler developers. So um, you should stay compatible is the lesson. Lesson number three, this is where uh, industry comes into play. Um, big companies prefer designing for performance per uh, total cost of operation rather than capital expense. Capital expense is a fancy way of saying how much something costs, how much a chip costs, while operational expenses, how much it costs to run it. So uh, electricity, provisioning for its uh, cooling and so on. Now over the three year, three to five year uh, lifespan of hardware, the total cost of operation is essentially the sum of these two. Now, users usually generally generally prefer uh, something um, or optimizing for performance for capital ex expense. So you want a very good GPU for a little money. But companies, they prefer that for them, the, the uh, operational costs actually uh, are quite a substantial portion of the, of the overall total expense. So they prefer to actually design their chips for performance per TCO. And as you can see for this, from this uh, graph provided in the paper, there's a strong correlation between the system's TDP and the TCO. So more powerful chips actually are more expensive to run. Next, we have some lessons that specifically for DNNs, uh, DNN DSAs. So for example, TPUs over here. And um, the team at Google, they are working very closely with Google developers. And they notice that the developers really don't like changing their architectures. So for example, methods such as quantizing the models, which could give you extra boost, 
are costly and uh, the developers would lose accuracy. So they really don't want to do that. Also, the developers are constrained in terms of, for example, deploying in time and so on. So you should really uh, design your hardware, your new hardware, to be as backwards compatible as possible so you can minimize the effort of migrating to this new hardware. Number five, uh, inference DSAs should be air-cooled. Um, when you look at the table of TDPs, um, initially, the TDPs of the previous versions have cont con continuously risen all the way to 450 watts, which required liquid cooling in the TPU version 3. Now, for a global deployment in small little um, worldwide um, server farms, um, adding liquid cooling infrastructure would have been uh, infeasible or too expensive. So the paper really emphasizes that the inference chips, which should be placed close to users, should be air-cooled. And this is the reason for de decreasing the TDP. Number six, um, floating point numbers are important. So uh, generally, uh, it is a very common practice for inference chips to only provide quantized integer um, uh, inference, such, as, such was the case in TPU version one. However, quickly the engineers realized that this was a mistake. Quantization means you essentially trade the better area and power um, performance for a reduced um, accuracy of your model. But as you can see, some models are actually not, it's not great for them to be quantized. For example, this segmentation model really fails to capture the, the, the outline of the, of the people in the foreground where, when being quantized. Also, quantization usually brings um, decreased accuracy. And just to give you a perspective, ImageNet only improved by 1% over one span of one year, which could be undone by just quantizing it. So inference hardware should still support uh, floating point operations in order to stay backwards compatible. And finally, we have some lessons regarding DNN applications specifically. So especially in Google workloads, um, a lot of the applications require multi-tenancy or being able to swap models uh, quickly. This kind of sharing on the, on the resources can, first of all, lower costs. In some cases where some applications require multiple models, it can uh, reduce the overall latency. And it also allows uh, software uh, engineering flexibility where you can, for example, test different new applications on a subset of users while, um, um, yeah. So hardware should be able to support uh, quickly switching between different models. Since eight and nine, we're almost at the end. Um, these two are so sort of similar related. Um, this is the observation that DNNs grow over time, like any kind of software that you are familiar with. Um, at Google, it's about 1.5 times per year. And that means that the hardware actually needs to be able to accommodate um, these increased workloads over its entire lifespan. So you kind of need to over-design the TPUs, the, the hardware, so that it's still relevant even for growing DNN workloads. And as you can see from the share of uh, Google's workloads, um, between 2016 and 2020, um, the MLPs are slowly being replaced by RNNs and BERT, uh, meaning that if you are designing hardware, it should stay flexible so that even in the future for the coming models, you can still exploit your, your chips and you don't have to replace them. And finally, we have um, the observation that generally when we think about hard, machine learning hardware, we want to perform as many inferences uh, as possible in a way throughput or batch size. But in uh, Google data centers, it's actually the latency that is the main limitation. So uh, usually the hardware should be able to provide very low latency. That means between um, the time between when you provide the input and when you get the answer. So now that we know the summary of the 10 lessons, let's look at how they apply to the hardware and what were some of the design choices that the architects have made in order to um, exploit them. So first of all, uh, compiler compatibility. The TPU version 4 is actually mainly, the hardware is based on TPU version 3, um, meaning that they can exploit pretty much most of, the, most of the compiler optimizations that have been performed before. And also they stay uh, machine learning backwards compatible. 
Looking at the XLA compiler specifically, um, it actually compiles in kind of two layers. It performs so-called high-level optimizations or high-level operations and low-level operations. The high-level operations, they are kind of machine independent. So any kind of optimization that you perform there can be transferred between all the various uh, TPU versions. Low-level operations, however, are very specific to hardware. Therefore, even if you have new hardware support, as we will see later, um, you, can, you can exploit it um, in the current architecture. So in a way, when you have, whenever you have some source code, this, uh, this XLA compiler will give you a different binary for every single TPU version, uh, giving you the most performance that you can get for each. Right after compiler, the second most important uh, um, thing to, to, uh, that a designer has to keep in mind is memory on the chip. And there is a lot. So first of all, um, the HPM that I have talked about earlier has been kept from TPU version three. And this essentially allows a relatively large uh, storage still very close to the core. Um, that um, you can store um, your models on. It allows for rapidly switching between different models, so supporting the multi-tenancy, and it allows you to grow the DNNs uh, in the future potentially. And being, um, being more efficient than, for example, classical DRAM, it also exploits um, the rule number one that we have talked about. Another huge change that they have made was adding this huge CMEM. Now, um, or common memory, it takes up 28% of the chip, which means that it's quite a significant, um, significant area and therefore also capital expense. However, as we will see later, this actually corresponds to quite a lot of improvements um, in, uh, in performance, since they can place very large data structures extremely close to the processing elements. Um, and they can, uh, and it's much more efficient than putting it, for example, in the DRAM. And finally, um, they have included a new so-called 4D tensor DMA, which is just a very fancy unit that can be programmed to efficiently move data between the individual blocks in the, in the core. And um, the, one, some of its properties are that it's, for example, very highly programmable, meaning uh, it can exploit some of the compiler um, optimizations, and it can provide for lower latency throughout the chip. This DMA is actually part of this OCI or on-chip interconnect, which is also a uh, new um, kind of interconnect that they have uh, included on the chip. Uh, generally, point-to-point -point routing is not any more feasible due to the um, infeasible wire scaling. So this OCI sort of takes the form of a network where individual, uh, all the elements can kind of communicate between each other. It's again, a very flexible and scalable topology, meaning, um, future proof. And um, as you can see, it also has a uh, per core much higher bandwidth. So while the TPU v uh, V3 had 900 gigabytes per second for two cores, over here uh, we have four times 153, so 612 gigabytes per second per core. So um, that's about a 30% boost in, in um, uh, speed. In the arithmetic units, as we have talked about, um, the, we have, they are still supporting integer um, and floating points, uh, therefore not really uh, requiring quantization. This was possible mainly because the logic is free, so they could fit all this extra, extra hardware in without any issues. And it also maintains backwards compatibility, as we have talked about. And talking to the to the hardware to the compiler developers, they have realized that they can actually support more computational resources. So they have actually doubled the number of MXUs um, to so that they can fully exploit um, all the all the all the compiler optimizations. And uh, speaking of some some very highly specific things that the paper has mentioned. Uh, they also, for example, um, designed custom uh, for input floating point adders. Um, again, this was mainly done so that they can reduce the, the overall area um, and reduce the, the peak power, which is uh, something that um, relates to the total TDP. So talking about the, speaking of the total TDP, 
Um, it is again much closer to the first version of TPUs at about uh, 175 watts, allowing for air cooling and, of course, reducing the total uh, operating expenses. And finally, we've got um, ICI scaling. Uh, so, um, in order to facilitate the future expansions, the team has also included this, um, this ICI li link, which interchip interconnect, which allows uh, four chips to be kind of co connected together and exchange information extremely efficiently. Again, this is uh, regarding rule number eight of where you can fit larger and scaling um, DNNs in the future onto the chips without an issue. And finally, they, they also included quite a few performance counters. Those are mainly for um, optimizing and tuning the compilers even further and facilitating the, the, the um, uh, developer's work. So let's look at uh, what all of this uh, work has gotten them. Well, we can see that um, compared to the TPU version 3, it's actually not much faster. It's about the same speed as, um, as the uh, TPU version, version 3. It's about twice as fast as uh, TPU version 2. However, since the TPU version 3 is so much more powerful in terms of how much energy it consumes, overall, TPU version 4 actually wins out on, um, wins out on the performance per TCO, or total cost of operation. Um, it is about 2.3 times uh, faster in terms of performance per TDP versus the TPU v3. And when, you, when the paper broke down uh, where these performance boosts came from, they identified that about 1.5 uh, times boost was from adding this extra 128 megabytes of uh, CMEM. Second most important was probably the, the improvement in architecture, so going from 16 nanometers to 7 nanometers and the rest of the uh, improvements are attributed to about 20% boost. So let's look at some of the strengths of the paper. Um, the, the, the team has had a lot of experience. Uh, they are designing these CPUs for over five years now. And um, you can clearly see this from the paper that these people know what they're talking about. Um, some of the lessons that they have expanded in depth in the paper are very, very interesting to, to read. And um, it provides a very detailed overview of what goes on into developing a modern DSA architecture in some sort of like industrial environment. Um, they have done a lot of extra um, analysis of the workloads that I am not going to go into depth here, but um, clearly they know very well what the Google's workload is and they can adjust the hardware, really, really tailor the hardware for the workloads that they require. And the entire paper was very um, pragmatic, very industry focused, as I said. And um, you can see that it is uh, not a research paper, more of a documentation of how it works in the industry. However, some of these are kind of also the weaknesses of the paper. So being such a wide paper, it was extremely broad. Some of, the, some of the designs were actually only covered very superficially and um, also because some of the designs were kind of proprietary or were secretive. So they haven't gone into very detail of what some of the implementations are. Also, um, some of the lessons that they mention are in my opinion, very restrictive. So for example, this backwards compatibility, it's understandable that in an industrial setting, you really want to um, provide as much support to your developers and not sort of bog them down, but um, it kind of does restrict innovation or, for example, exploiting new architectures um, that, that could potentially give you a bigger uh, performance boost. Also, the number of benchmarks were actually quite limited when, when uh, uh, although, although very extensively benchmarking their TPUs, comparing it to other DSA architectures, it was very superficial, so they only um, sort of mentioned other DSAs from Alibaba and so on. They haven't really performed any kind of benchmarks, so it's hard to judge how good actually the chip is uh, relative to its competition. And um, comparing it to um, other architectures such as CPUs or GPUs, they did compare it to the NVIDIA T4, 
but um, that was they, for example, haven't compared it to any of the latest uh, NVIDIA GPUs that are much more powerful. They mainly benchmarked on Google workloads, uh, which I have a problem with since um, it might work very well for them, but who knows how it, well it will work, for example, for other companies that have probably completely different uh, demands on their, um, on their workloads. And then some of the lessons were quite redundant. And to be honest, I think that's just because they wanted to round the number up to 10. And... But nevertheless, there were some many key takeaways. Um, so the documentation of, um, of uh, the unequal technology grow growth is actually something that I think is very important to realize and exploit in your designs. Um, especially it's important to realize the importance of compilers and being backwards compatible with them since many architectures have gone under because they had very bad compiler support. Uh, the idea of designing for the total cost of operation rather uh, versus uh, capital expense or performance per capital expense is something that is not very familiar to many of us, but it's something that is uh, more desired in an industry. Uh, and also the, the, the strong, strong, um, uh, strong significance of the backwards compatibility or emphasis on backwards compatibility in production uh, is something that is uh, worth considering when designing new architectures. Knowing your workload. Uh, yes, always know your workload so that you know what you're actually optimizing. And the, uh, the strength of uh, iteratively improving and being able to test your ideas is something that I think is key in order to produce good uh, designs. So now I have some discussion questions for you. Um, as the Moore's Law is reaching its plateau, um, what are sort of the next ways to that we can kind of keep pace with these everlasting and ever growing DNN models? What is um, if if these compilers and uh, hardware are so um, restricted um, or have to be uh, or have to be always backwards compatible? Isn't this kind of restricting, um, especially in the production hardware? And finally. Um, if we sacrifice some of the compatible, some of this flexibility and backwards compatibility, um, can we get more um, more performance out of your, our hardware? But at what cost? So, I'm welcome to any questions you have about this paper. And um, thank you. <laughs> yes, do we have a microphone? Hi. Um, a question I have about the numbers that go down, like the power that is used, and I think also the area of the of the dial that went down. Um, is this also related to um, the fact that they only designed the chip for inference? Um, would there be uh, like would the savings be less significant if you also included training um, in the in the um, abilities of the chip? I'm trying to go back to the table. It's somewhere at the beginning. There we go. Yeah. So, so yes, you are right. It is they have they are restricting themselves by only, for example, providing inference. Uh, they have talked about some some optimizations, such as you don't um, really need, for example, read write memory um, in an inference chip because you are mainly reading your weights, for example. So yes, there are of course some optimizations that you could do um, and therefore you don't have to have such a large uh, chip area. But as I said, they were mainly designing to have a low TCO, low total cost of operation and having a large chip corresponds to having a lot of capital expense, a, a very expensive chip. So that's why they really wanted to create a small chip that is uh, more, uh, more powerful, but, but cheaper to make. So then the idea is to design a separate chip that only is used for training or what would be like the yeah. way to go then? So, so um, for example, the TPU V3, which is uh, liquid cooled, they have said that, for example, for training, it's not an issue to put all the training chips into one data center and provide liquid cooling in this data center. And uh, yes, then you can have basically have it eat as much power as you want. 
But since this chip is designed to be distributed around the world close to users in order to minimize the latency, you, you can't, uh, that's why they decided to split it up into inference and training chips. Okay, thanks. And uh, still connected to this question. Uh, I also noticed that the NVIDIA T4 has uh, 40 uh, cores per chip, whereas the TPU version 4 has only one. Do you, uh, do you know any, do you have any idea of why is that or? Uh, um, yeah, so uh, basically you can also kind of get a hint at the MXU size. So um, the MXU or the multi matrix multiply unit of the TPU V4 is much bigger than the, than the NVIDIA. So the NVIDIA sort of went in the way of having many small uh, winky, wimpy cores versus the TPU went for having one, but more beefy. And they described that uh, they the TPU team, um, or I, I should say the compiler team thinks that it's easier to uh, create code for one um, powerful core than versus multiple uh, wimpy cores. Okay, thanks. <laughs> um, I have two questions. One is very general. How did they come up with these lessons? Like, do they have any sort of systematic approach or evaluate them or is it just like gut feeling? <laughs> I think I think it was mainly gut feeling. So in the paper, they haven't really talked about it, and this is why I say basically uh, you can feel that uh, it's a they are speaking from experience. So it's something. Um, some of the lessons they they do have measurable data to support it. So for example, the growth of the DNNs or the the shrinking of the. Um, um, or irregular uh, improvement in technology. Many of them are supported by numbers, but it, it is uh, more of a gut feeling of what is important or what they feel like is going to give them the biggest uh, improvement or what's important for their workload. Okay. And the other question is, I thought about this lesson eight about the scalability and the two interchip interconnects. What do they estimate is the lifetime of one version of TPU? I mean, how did they come up with a two interchip? Yeah. So um, basically the, the hardware is designed for three to five years. So <laughs> you can, you can, um, they also have, if I scroll to my backup slides, they have done, uh, so for example, uh, it was really interesting. They went into how they decided to go with 128 megabytes of, um, it's over here, uh, of uh, the CMEM. And uh, here they, you can see kind of like the relative performance of, uh, of applications as they were increasing the CMEM over time. Um, and they decided that 128 gave them the best performance for uh, the, the smallest chip area uh, while still allowing some growth. It, so you see most applications top out at about 25% uh, capacity, uh, meaning you still have yeah, three quarters of the uh, memory kind of available for growth. Thanks. So um, was what I was wondering about, I think two weeks ago, we had the paper about Prose and I skipped through the slides quickly. So maybe a quick recap for you too. It was about a, a, bird, style, a bird style acceleration uh, specific for the inputs um, or to, for protein, protein discovery. And what's interesting is that um, in the paper, they compare the accelerator with a TPU version two. Mm -hmm. And in the paper, or oh, well, the, the accelerator in the paper uses uh, many different or three different kinds of um, arrays of processing elements. And I think that's, I, I couldn't read anything, uh, everything in there, but I, if I remember correctly, a lot of speed up came from there. Now the inputs in the paper are pretty specific, but I think like workloads aren't the same for all neural networks and, and stuff. And this paper was about, um, oh, it just came in 2022. But anyways, yeah, there are such papers available with uh, innovation uh, from, from the science world. And if I remember correctly reading the Google paper, mm -hmm. they don't really mention such influence. 
do they? Uh, can you repeat which influence? I didn't catch it. Yeah, from the from the science world, it seems like they're only talking about their experiences, and and there are many interesting influences that could come from from outside. Mm. I, I'm missing that. I think I think this is mainly because, as I said, it's a very industry uh, perspective that this paper gives. So they are designing chips for Google for Google workload. And therefore, maybe there is kind of a separation in terms of, um, the, yeah. But I'm sure that they are still getting inspired also from, from the science world. It's just that they are not designing chips for the science world. Yeah, but still I was missing any influences, which is kind of sad, because maybe that on your second discussion point, um, that's why we have industry and science, because science can be more creative mm -hmm. they don't need to restrict themselves maybe that much to mm -hmm. compiler uh, to, to restrictions mentioned here so yeah that's what i'm i think missing, i think yeah missing in the paper um that was that i agree yeah that was that wasn't really uh talked about this was um yeah you're right i and yeah about this point actually um we had some discussion with my with my um with my supervisors on this that it is um it is kind of sad that these these industries sort of uh, go kind of only in their own tracks and and ignore maybe the um, the outside influence, um, but uh, yes, it's something that works for them. <laughs> it's what uh, drives what give, what generates the money. Okay, thanks. Yeah, but I don't know how else to like answer. <laughs> no, I mean, it's it's not a question. It's a yeah, yeah, comment. View. Yeah. <laughs> So seeing that this paper has been written entirely by people from Google, I haven't read the paper, but maybe in your point of view, do you think that the true strength of this paper is maybe not the lessons that they talk about, but rather that they expose some of Google's uh, thought how, process. A thought process and their actual chips and what it looks like and the way they're doing things, kind of like a peek into what Google is doing. Mm -hmm. Do you think the paper contributes something or maybe tells us something about the way Google is doing things? Um, yes, it is. It is a very interesting uh, probe into kind of their mindsets of, of the people at Google. Um, and yes, I, I agree. It is. Um, we can definitely learn something from from uh, the, this industry approach, um, and it would be quite interesting probably to have maybe like a conversation for the discussion with the Google team and see um, what else can we learn and what maybe as was suggested uh, Google can learn from uh, from science. <laughs> so yes, thanks. That makes sense. Anybody else? I guess I we have a question on Moodle. Ah yes. Alexander, go ahead. Uh, he's raising his hand. A Moodle. Yeah, hey, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, so I have a couple of questions, but um, maybe one question now, not to you, but rather to the person who asked the question before the previous one. Um, you mentioned something about this paper focusing on google specific workloads and not on workloads from the science world i'm not sure what you mean exactly by this um these would i i think that these would be standard data sets that are used to benchmark models both in google and in this well science world and google has also also has the advantage of having an insane amount of data so uh what did you mean exactly um, well, do you hear me? Yes. Uh, I, I didn't mean that they don't use workloads from science. I meant that I'm missing any influence, any innovation that came from the science part. They only talk about their experiences with their processes and what they learn from it. And there's so much going on outside of Google. Um, so many interesting papers. I mean, we had some papers here in the course. So I was just missing the, the, the uh, this influence in in the paper that's that was what i'm talking about 
Ah, okay, okay, thanks. That makes sense. And now a question to you. Um, so, and this one's on slide eight. I have written down. We talked about the difference in how quickly logic and memory seems to be progressing. Yep. So I just noticed that uh, there's this number next to one megabyte SRAM. It's actually the biggest, the largest yeah, so number there is in terms of improvement. So what's that about? Yeah, so I, I was waiting if anybody can notice that. Um, yeah, it was actually talked about in the paper. You can see the little number one uh, next to it. And there was a footnote basically explaining that um, during the 45 nanometer um, um, technology nodes, uh, the one megabyte uh, RAM was implemented through like multiple uh, kind of eight kilobyte uh, RAM sets bunched together. Well, today it's like one huge block. Therefore, it kind of falsely gives the impression that it's, it actually improved uh, much more, but relatively it has actually also not improved that much. It's, it's kind of like the, the, the in, back in uh, 45 nanometers, it was wor worse than, than normal. <laughs> So it gives okay. a full sense of impression of improvement. <laughs> cool, thanks. Um, if you don't mind, I also have one more uh, thing. So regarding discussion point one, we talk about um, what should we do in order to keep up with these massive models that just seem to keep growing and growing. Um, what are the next steps in terms of technology, I would say is implied by this question but maybe it makes more sense to put more focus on actually stopping these models from growing anymore, yeah. right? Rather than coming up with pushing transistors to even smaller sizes, they're about to be as small as atoms if they aren't already. Mm -hmm. So, Yes, yeah, yeah. I think that's a very valid point. Uh, um, there's also a question of maybe maybe this entire approach of um, computing all the all the weights the way we are doing it with basically linear algebra maybe that's not the right way to do it maybe like something like a spiking neural network or um, some completely different architecture is um, a way to go to go even low power and uh, even more scalable but yes stopping the growth is I think also a valid way to solve this <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> if not, then I think uh, we can uh, wrap this up. Uh, I'm fast. So first of all, though, to, towards the end, I would also like to thank my uh, advisors who have provided a lot of feedback on these slides. And so thank you very much. I guess there was one question in the classroom. And there was one, where? Before no. we take uh, the question on Moodle. The um, question on Moodle? Before we take it, uh, there was one in the classroom. Ah, yeah. ah there was you, so. Yeah. Hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can't hear you, if you can use the mic. Yeah, he's, yeah, yeah. the microphone yeah, is on great. the way. <laughs> can you hear me now? Thanks. Yeah, okay. Um, so yeah, it was mostly about the first discussion point that was kind of touched upon uh, with the previous question. Um, you, yeah, you say that you're, you're asking like, how do we keep up with the growing DNN models? But I feel like they're already sort of managing to do that because most, most of the speed up in this, like their uh, TPU v4 isn't from, I mean, the Denard scaling, right? It's from their improvements. You only got, what was it? 1.2 X speed up from Denard scaling? And uh, yeah, most of it is so far from a memory, but still, uh, for example, SRAM density yeah. is also slowing down. Right. Yeah. So at some point you will, you will also basically reach a limit, a plateau where you won't be able to basically uh, get more out of the hardware. I guess the sort of general response to this kind of thing is just make more specific accelerators make them more and more specific. Yes, but, but then that, that is essentially, again, uh, reducing the flexibility. So yeah. going back to, back to this point over here, uh, you want to kind of stay backwards compatible. And if you start making uh, very specific accelerators, well, in a couple of years, uh, new DNN models will uh, come up, which might not be able to use your accelerator anymore. 
<laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, I was going to say maybe one last thing is maybe people should be looking into, because I, I think Intel looked into this at some point, integ integrating FPGAs in their, like uh, along with their processors to allow for sort of soft accelerators in such a, in, in a sense where. Like reconfigurable accelerators. Yeah, or it wouldn't really matter if it's like ultra specific because you can sort of change the hardware on the fly. Yeah, you can bring the accelerator along with the pro like software you're trying to mm. run. So maybe that could be an I, approach. I think I think going to points like uh, lesson one where logic is virtually free, you, you might be actually right. Um, but at the same time, I think uh, there's still so much overhead yeah, that sure. uh, of having all this FPGA hardware around to facilitate this configurability that um, if you are really aiming for low power and low TDP for this performance, uh, it still can be matched. Yeah, well, I guess that's probably why it's still an open mm. question, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Do anybody else, any final thoughts? <laughs> no? Okay, then thank you very much for listening. <laughs>
<laughs> I didn't receive it here. Okay. Oh, sorry. I sent my own email and in. then I just. Okay, otherwise, I would just type in the link. Uh, oh, okay. It was just taking sweet time. Me and computers. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, which one do you want? The PDF you can just one? go on the Google. Uh, this one. Or the Google link. It's either one works. Uh, what do you think here. is better? Google and presentations. Google. Perfect. Is in Greek, I know. No. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. I also wanted. Okay, okay, yeah, that's. That Maybe is that one? Yeah, that was. Okay, but great. I need to take one more thing. Okay. Sure. Edit one more tiny discussion point. No problem. Okay. Oh, I just hope I don't break this one. <laughs> <laughs> Mine is already broken. Um, is there a clicker? We don't have one, don't I guess, one. unfortunately. Okay. It's fine. Um, I added an, a multi-layer execution also as a discussion point. No, because I think that the current model doesn't do that yet, right? No, it does not. And that could be something else. Interesting. interesting. Also, right? And they show some data by showing that. Um, but how do I want to get that? Oh. So I just need to turn this off. Mm -hmm. Uh, I will just leave it. I will just say it. Yeah, yeah, no, it's that's the problem. <laughs> it's so fine. I'll just leave it. No, no, I'll just do it. I'll just do it. Okay. But if you want to do it, it should be yeah, like. Yeah, that's the problem with the. Uh, okay. It yeah. should be two. Two. <laughs> and then you can. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I can. Perfect. Type it. Thank you. Um, I just need to lower the execution. Five minutes, huh? Five minutes. Maybe just one more thing. Okay, so from execution, and then yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, John, do we need to do anything for the live stream or can just start? They can start right away. This is your microphone. Yeah. I'm not sure you stream on mobile. Ah, you stream. Gerald, do you need to turn on the data show, I guess? We can see the slide, but not the classroom. Oh, you pressed something here as well. <laughs> no. everything looks okay i guess it's perfect but the microphone you have it's turned off i guess i can't hear you hello 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 can you yes, hear me now, now it's well now it's well can you hear me as well yes yes very well i guess Geraldo is going to introduce you then you can start yes so hopefully you can hear me uh, so a lot is going to present this paper uh, that we present last year on PEC 2021. Uh, it's a really long title, Google Neural Network Models for Edge Devices. Um, so this is uh, a paper that Amirali Boromet did when he was an uh, in internship at Google in 2019. Uh, I was also there, um, I, somewhere were there. And, and we were actually working really closely to the... Uh, Google HTPU team. Uh, we were not working on the version four. We were working on a previous version. Uh, version four was still in development back then. But yeah, this paper is going to show a lot of um, uh, characterization of those models and some problems that uh, the Google HTPU faces. So it's going to answer some of the questions from previous uh, discussion. Uh, so Lottie is a fifth year, no, fifth semester uh, computer science student. She also holds a um, 
degree from economics, which is really cool, from the University of St. Gallen. And yeah, uh, feel free to start. Perfect. Thank you for that nice introduction. Um, can you hear me well? Okay, more or less. <laughs> I will try to talk louder. Um, so welcome to, uh, to this talk. As uh, Geraldo introduced, I'm going to jump right into an executive summary and you're going to get very sick of this slide because you're going to see it over and over and over again. So first, um, to the context of this paper, this paper um, talks about edge ML accelerators and how they execute inference and specifically how this inference execution, um, how this performance differs between um, or across a wide range of different um, ML models, right? So it is an extensive analysis of a state-of-the-art um, ML accelerator, in particular the Google Edge TPU, um, and it uses 24 different Google networks to measure the performance. Um, the problem the, the paper then identifies is that this ML execution leads to three major shortcomings. Um, first, that it offer, operates significantly um, below, uh, below throughput. Um, second of all, there is, um, it uh, operates significantly below theoretical energy efficiency. And thirdly, it um, is very inefficient with regards to memory accesses. If you then um, read the paper further, you will see that the paper identifies uh, two things. First, that the layer characteristics um, significantly uh, vary between the different um, edge and M and L models, which are um, being analyzed. And then also that the monolithic design of the accelerator itself kind of is the reason um, all these shortcomings within performance um, exhibit. And through that, the paper draws the conclusion that customizing all accelerator, uh, accelerator components um, are needed so to, to customize all the accelerator components with regards to these specific layer characteristics um, to achieve a good performance. It then moves on to um, propose a key new mechanism, which is called Mensa. It is an acceleration uh, framework, which does specifically this. So it has uh, many different um, heterogeneous accelerators that are specialized for these specific layer characteristics. Um, finally, it provides also a specific Mensa framework. So it's called Mensa G, which applies this Mensa framework to the Google um, models used. And um, it evaluates its performance gains as well as its um, an eff uh, efficiency gains. And we'll see that later. So um, the outline of my talk will follow a very similar structure as um, the executive summary just outlined. We'll start with the context, then we'll look more at the problem, the key insights, key mechanisms, and then we'll close off with the results. So first, let's um, look at the context of this paper, or rather let's look why ML is um, deployed on, on edge devices in the first place. Um, and specifically also, what is edge computing, right? Um, edge computing is the computation storage and analysis of data close to where the data is actually being consumed, uh, produced and consumed that is on the actual edge devices. Um, and then once this processing has occurred, some of this data might or might not be sent to the uh, data warehouses or to the cloud. Um, originally, uh, edge computing was developed to um, address uh, bandwidth problems and latency problems, but specifically with regards to um, fast or, or far away um, data. Um, data uh, yeah so, so when data was transmitted for long distances right but um, also other consumer demands have driven these uh, increased demand for edge computing particularly um, privacy uh, concerns as well as concerns with regards to um, real-time connectivity as well as re uh, low latency so real-time computing um, on the other hand we have technology advancements such as internet of things which produces a vast amount of um, data and we also have um, 5g which uh, is increasingly being adopted, which kind of also push towards this edge computing. However, due to the um, inherent mobile nature of these edge devices, we have the problem that we, um, have, we are very resource constrained. Um, so we have a very restrictive power budget as well as um, very limited um, computational resources. This means that uh, these edge devices have a tendency to employ accelerators um, specifically also for, for um, L. Um, but also for other areas, uh, computational areas. But then on the other hand, we also have algorithm development. So we have NN models, which are or neural network models, which are specifically designed to fit into these resource constraint devices, right? Um, we'll look into each of these in more detail now. First, we'll look at the um, algorithm development. 
So just to give you a short overview, but I'm sure most of you guys or all of you guys already know, NN models are basically consist of different layers and each layer consists of input activations and parameters and then produces a series of output activations, right? But beyond this structure, there's quite a diverse range of different NN models. Um, for example, there are conv convolutional neural networks, or called CNN, um, which are feedforward multilayer networks. And as you can see here, they usually have a couple of convolutional uh, layers in the beginning through which they um, extract certain features, and then they feed that into a fully connected layer to actually predict um, specific spatial features. So given, given their um, adaptivity to feature extraction, they're usually used for image classification or object detection. Um, secondly, we have long short term memory networks, LSTMs, um, which are multi layer models with recurrent connections. Through this recurrent connection, they can ensure some kind of um, memory, um, which is in particular done through different cells. So each LSTM model consists of different layers, which each again consists of different cells, which each again have four different um, gates, as you can see here. And these gates are kind of used to. to um, change the data flow within, within the cell as well as to update memory, right? Um, so LSTMs are used to uh, classify a series of data. And then through their memory, they can also predict uh, future sequences of data. So they're very useful, for example, for traffic forecasting or text reply um, prediction. Then um, we have transducers, which are typically implemented by stacking different LSTM models uh, upon each other. And they usually consist of an encoder, a predictor, as well as a joiner. So what they do is um, they classify also a series of input data, but they can um, handle certain variations or distortions within the input data. So it's, for example, very good for automatic speech recognition, where you don't always have very um, clear data as an input. And then finally, we have um, recurring convolutional networks, which are hybrid multilayer recurrent networks. And they usually consist of first um, CNN models, which are used to extract features. And then these features are fed into LSTMs, which from these features kind of try to make predictions out of their sequences. So they can capture um, spatial temporal information, for example, um, image captioning or video scene labeling. Um, these are basically the four NN models that are currently um, very frequently used. Um, and the model, uh, the, the paper uh, chooses 24 of these, and particularly 13 CNNs, two LSTMs, um, six uh, transducers, and three RCNNs um, to analyze them in more detail and also their, their inference, uh, inference performance on the Google TPU. Um, so now that we've looked at the algorithm development, um, we'll look at the accelerator deployment, um, particularly which accelerator this uh, paper uses to. to uh, see the inference um, performance of these different models. This paper uses uh, the Edge TPU, the Google Edge TPU, which is um, a state-of-the-art accelerator. And like most state-of-the-art accelerators, it uh, follows a very monolithic uh, one-size-fits-all design, um, meaning it has a very large uh, processing element uh, array, in this case, 64 by 64. Um, it has a very large uh, on-chip buffer, which is used to store uh, both parameters as well as input activations. Um, we have a static data flow, which is very uh, strict with regards to how these um, parameters can flow between the buffer as well as the PE um, array. And then we also have an off-chip bandwidth, which is also fixed, um, that connects the DRAM to, to this accelerator. And then the models are stored within the DRAM and then kind of layer by layer um, gotten from, from the DRAM. Um, so, <laughs> I told you, you'll get sick of the slide. <laughs> Take away from now, um, we're looking at 24 different models within, within this different range of, of different models, and we're looking at the um, Google TPU. And now we're looking at the problems this Google TPU um, has when we actually perform, uh, perform these um, different models on them. And um, what we can identify from this is that there is actually three major shortcomings. Um, First of them is that we have a very high resource on reutilization. So on this um, on this graph, you can see that we map the the throughput, the TFLOP, so the Terra uh, floating point operations per second, um, to the TFLOP per byte, and um, we can see that the peak uh, throughput would be about two teraflops. Um, however, the, T, uh, the TPU actually only utilizes about 24% uh, of this peak uh, throughput if you, average this, uh, if you average this across all the 24 models, right? 
Um, and then if you in detail look at the specific ones, we see that um, only about zero, uh, only 1% of the peak uh, throughput is actually used for transducers, as well as for LSTM models on average. Um, CNN and RCNN perform a bit better, but they also only um, about reach about 40.7 uh, um, on average, right? That is the first problem. The second problem is that we have a very low energy efficient, uh, efficiency if we do this inference. Um, that is, we only reach about 37% of uh, peak energy efficiency if we once again average it across all the different models. Once again, um, transducers and LSTMs perform much worse with only 33.8% uh, of peak efficiency as an upper bound. And um, CNN and RCNN have about 50.7, so a bit better, but still not as good as could be. Um, then the third shortcoming the paper identifies is that we have a very inefficient memory handling. Um, and that becomes visible if we break down the energy um, that is used during inference execution across the different models. Um, two things we can identify from this is that um, first, we have a very high efficiency cost uh, high energy cost um, due to large on-chip on -chip buffers. Um, that is first, they have, a very, uh, they have a very high dynamic cost because they're very large. Um, and then they also have a very high static cost when they're being accessed. Uh, then on the other hand, we have very high uh, cost of off-chip memory access. And that is actually the problem that while we do have these large buffers on the Google TPU, only um, about 11.9% of the parameters are actually stored with them then, because um, as we'll see later in the analysis, this buffer is very, very inefficient. So despite being very energy, uh, very energy, um, <laughs> very energy um, intensive, or yeah, take, despite that the buffer takes a lot of energy, right? It still doesn't uh, reduce the memory accesses. So they incur additional um, memory uh, energy shortcomings. So uh, to wrap it all up, once again, we have three shortcomings. We have peak throughput problems, we have energy efficiency problems, and we have a memory access problem. Um, we'll now look at the key insights. As I've hinted already, um, this paper identifies that the NN model characteristics uh, actually can kind of show why we have these problems. Um, and to do that, this paper analyzes these 24 different models at the level of um, layer general, uh, general granularity, I need to join something real quick. Um, and, but while I do, I will like show you this, uh, this graph. Mm. That is, here we see that um, if we look at the parameter footprint of the different models, we have the layers of CNN as well as RCNN on top here on the left. And then we have the layers of um, LSTM and transducers on the bottom. And we can see that they have a very different um, parameter footprint. So the LSTMs and the transducers tend to have a very high uh, footprint compared to the, uh, the CNNs. But we also see the flop per byte, which is kind of a parameter of, re, uh, of par, um, parameter reusing. So how often once you fetch the parameter, how often it's actually used. Um, we see that the uh, LSTMs as well as the transducers have, have very, very low um, reuse of their parameters, right? Um, and then we can kind of explain this first by the layer composition, the memory footprint we can explain by the layer composition, because um, as I've just briefly mentioned, the LSTM models, they have a lot of different gates within, e uh, within each cell. And each of these gates actually has a very, very large amount of parameters it uses, such that um, overall, a layer within an LSTM model uh, has almost 70 million parameters compared to a CNN model, which has only 33.4 um, megabytes of parameters. So there's a very um, large difference, right? Um, if you look at the flop per uh, byte ratio, you see that there is a very different reuse patterns within LSTM models. So the LSTM models have a tendency to only cache, uh, to only use the, the, the fetched parameters once and don't reuse them. They also have a much lower computational complexity compared to CNN models. They actually are 67% uh, fewer Mac, uh, Mac operations compared to CNNs. And um, they have a lot of intra and inter cell dependencies, which are not taken into account during scheduling of these uh, layers, because as, as, as I've mentioned, they have recurrent um, links. So these, so, and they have these different gates, which do matrix computation. So instead of um, doing all of these matrix computations at the same time, 
they usually the TPO actually schedules them in, in series, which uh, leads to very low, um, a very low reuse uh, of parameters, right? Um, but this is not the only thing. So these are the layer, uh, the, the heterogeneity within uh, across these different four layer types. But what this paper also identified is that we have a very high layer heterogeneity within each individual model. Um, and this is something very interesting. For example, if you here look at the CNNs, you can see that um, within a CNN model, you have the MAC intensity um, layers significantly, for example, from, from um, layers which are used within the beginning of this model compared to layers which are used at kind of the lower end of the model. Um, and you can see similar things if you look at uh, the flop byte ratio, where you also see uh, significant variations. Um, this is if, especially interesting. Um, this is especially interesting if you look at traditional CNNs compared to CNNs which are employed on edge devices, because uh, traditional CNNs have have a tendency to have very uh, heterogeneous layers, right? So it doesn't depend. It it doesn't matter if you look at the beginning or the end of the model. They have a they're very similar with regards to their characteristics. Um, however, it, for for such um, algorithms to work better on on edge devices, there are a bunch of different um, decomposition techniques which are applied to these models to make them more resource sufficient or, or to um, to reduce their layer footprints. Um, and these actually kind of introduce a lot of these heterogeneities within these layers. So that is something very interesting um, this paper identified. And then, but this goes beyond CNNs, right? And particularly this uh, interlayer heterogeneity is very um, significant for our CNNs, as I've mentioned, because they actually consist of CNNs as well as LSTMs. So you have a lot of different layer characteristics if you look at the different layers within each model. Um, yes, uh, now, given that we have these two insights or uh, under, in light of these, in, uh, these two, two characteristics, we, this paper analyzes again these three shortcomings we've identified and then kind of identifies that this, these two things are actually the reason why, or because they're not employed because the design is monolithic, this is the reason why this model is so inefficient, right? Um, if we look at the PE under utilization, for example, we see that most executions um, suffer from memory bandwidth bottlenecks, um, particularly those which have very uh, low reuse pattern, as well um, as uh, large footprints. We also identify that this static data flow um, fails to exploit a lot of different data reuse patterns. So it's very efficient, for example, for CNNs, but it doesn't deploy the rest, uh, the, the other um, reuse patterns. And then we also see that uh, the fixed PE size is very unfit to um, efficiently execute different uh, sh shapes and dependencies. As I've mentioned, for example, we don't schedule um, the gate computations uh, parallel, but sequentially. Um, we also identify that the large on-chip buffer results in high energy, uh, energy costs. Um, we, and, and then through, through this inefficient memory utilization that the PE is usually um, underutilized with regards to LSTM, I mean, both with regards to memory access as well as, for example, because LSTM models have very low uh, MAC, uh, have a very low MAC intensity. Uh, we also see that the frequent off-chip traffic also results in, in high energy costs, right? So these are kind of the three things um, that are expl that explain the poor energy efficiency. If we look at the memory system issues, we can see that the the buffer, and this is, I think, was very um, interesting. So, if you actually look at, if you look at the buffer um, and what layers actually um, make use of this buffer, you see that the there's actually a very small fraction of layers who need a buffer, right? Because we have a lot of um, with LSTM, for example, we don't have a lot of data reuse, um, or we, uh, yeah, we have a data reuse that is not actually kind of integrated into this data flow. So first of all, this buffer is very unnecessary for a lot of, uh, for many, many of these layers. And then the second thing, which I thought was very interesting is that those layers who actually need the buffer have a very, very low um, parameter uh, footprint compared to the average uh, footprint, uh, compared to the average footprint. And that is uh, to be, or oh, I can find it, but uh, here, 0 0.21 uh, megabytes actually, only compared to the four megabyte buffer um, that is being employed. So there is quite a uh, over provisioning or an over, the, the buffer is very oversized compared to, to its actual usage. Um, and this of course kind of worsens this problem of energy efficiency because if for those parameters who actually need the buffer, they need to um, access it multiple multiple times because they keep reusing um, the same parameters. So they always pay this very high dynamic cost of this 
huge buffer, despite the fact that they only need a very small fraction. So um, if, as I've mentioned, kind of all of this can be tied down to this problem that we have a very monolithically designed accelerator um, that does not account for any kind of layer uh, heterogeneity whatsoever, because we have a fixed PE, we have a fixed buffer, we have a rigid data flow. Um, and then from that, the second insight is that this monolithic approach actually leads to all of these uh, performance inefficiencies, because this monolithic design works well, for example, on traditional CNN models, but it doesn't work well on the rest, um, which is kind of the main takeaway, right? That the HTPU uh, monolithic design is actually the root cause of all of these problems we've identified before. Um, yeah, so once again, our takeaway, <laughs> but uh, I'm sure you've read this so uh, So um, let's move on to the key mechanisms. So how are we gonna address this problem? Um, once again, uh, the current mechanism, right, is you have one model and you run the entire model on this one very monolithic um, accelerator. So it doesn't matter which model you use, they all go to the same one. Uh, this is kind of what, what Mensa challenges and, and how Mensa challenges this is they distribute the model layers um, across multiple specialized smaller accelerators. So when you take the model, you kind of feed into this runtime scheduler and then this runtime scheduler maps the different layers into different um, layer families. And then each of these families gets employed on a very specialized um, accelerator. And then these heterogeneous accelerators kind of are very, very specialized to, to this uh, subset of layer characteristics, right? Um, and through this, the uh, Mensa framework can um, avoid the shortcomings of this monolithic design. Um, not only that, but it can also leverage uh, these variations within as well as um, across the models to actually uh, achieve very high performance and very high efficiency. Um, just very quickly, um, but I won't have time to go in depth in this, um, the Mensa runtime scheduler uh, creates these layer mappings from there's a layer and then on which accelerator should be executed. And it does so using um, taking into account the accelerator characteristics, as well as different layer characteristics, including intralayer dependencies. Um, these are usually uh, generated during this initial setup of the system and are maintained um, within a hardware driver. So this is used to um, kind of decide for each layer on which accelerator it should be executed. So the, the kind of takeaway of, of this part is that Mensa consists of heter heterogeneous accelerators whose data flow um, as well as hardware are specialized for specific layer families. And I keep talking about layer families. Um, this is what we'll look into next. Um, it's actually very interesting because if you look at these 24 different Google Edge networks, um, and you look at uh, different characteristics, but in particular um, per meter reuse, per meter footprint, as well as MAC intensity, you can see that these actually map into two families. Um, and these families actually cover 97%, 90, yeah, 97% um, of all the models, you, uh, of all the layers within each of these models, right? And um, you can see that we have on the one side, we have the compute centric layers, which are family one and two. They have um, a rather small data, a parameter footprint, they have high data reuse, and they have a high MAC intensity, which a combination of this obviously leads to a high PE utilization, right? Because we, um, we use it and, and the PE runs a lot. Um, on the other hand, we have very data centric layers, uh, which are family three, four, and five. Um, they have a rather larger parameter footprint, they have a low data reuse, and they have a low MAC intensity, which obviously kind of results in, in a low um, PE utilization. Um, and yeah, as, as I've said, it's very interesting to see that the majority of these layers group into these layers. But what do we do with, with this um, conclusion? This conclusion was used by the paper to design a um, Mensa G, Mensa G for, for the Google Edge models. Um, and it could use these three um, to kind of come up with these three different heterogeneous accelerators, which are called um, Pascal Pavlov and Jack Rard. I'm sorry, this my font is <laughs> messed up. Um, but basically, uh, the Pasca one, the first one, addresses the families one and two, which are compute centrics, right? So we have a rather larger um, PE to ensure um, efficient execution of, of all of these um, MAC intensive uh, model layers. Um, we have a smaller buffer, we have a smaller parameter buffer, and we have this on chip, right? Because we don't need to access the memory, which is also why we have a rather low um, uh, yeah, bandwidth to memory. Secondly, for families three, um, which are data-centric layers, 
uh, we have a, a much, much smaller array because we have a very low Mac intensity. Um, we have a rather smaller um, buffer. We don't have any parameter buffers because we've, uh, we've analyzed before that these parameters are usually not reused at all. Um, and what is interesting is we put this actually very near um, to the data uh, to ensure a high bandwidth and to, uh, to account for all of this um, data exchange between the accelerator and the, D um, the DRAM. And then finally, we have the JQuart, which is used for families four and five, which are non-LSTM data-centric layers. Um, they use a little bit more Mac operations, so we have a bit of a bigger array. Um, we also have a little bit smaller buffers, and we also put this near the data processing. Um, if uh, yeah, if um, we take this um, these this five G model with uh, as long uh, along with its um, runtime scheduler, and we do an analysis, we find that this uh, Mensa G actually improves energy efficiency by three point zero times compared to the baseline. And what we compare to the baseline is that we actually take the baseline um, Google Edge TPU accelerator as well as an accelerator with a high bandwidth of memory. Um, to kind of see see uh, how significant the changes actually are. And what we can see is that um, we have a 15.3 lower off chip, um, on chip, off chip uh, parameter uh, traffic energy, because once again, we've kind of optimized for these different data flows and uh, we can reduce um, bandwidth or we can increase bandwidth drastically because we put it near the data, right? Um, and then on the other hand, we have almost 50% lower um, on chip dynamic energy because we've cut out this very uh, large buffer and we kind of use uh, specialized data flows. Um, similar analysis was conducted by the paper for, for throughput, and we see that we have a 3.1 um, uh, increase compared to the baseline. And um, this is kind of the takeaway uh, that we increase performance, we increase uh, efficiency, we also increase latency a bit, which you can read in the paper. Um, at the same time, we also reduce the cost of the entire TPU, um, and we can improve uh, area efficiency. Um, and as I've mentioned, I've, I kind of had to go over some things a bit quicker, for example, the details of how this uh, runtime scheduler actually uh, is implemented, the different design principles, a more detailed data flow, for example, analysis of all these different accelerators, as well as a, a much further analysis uh, of the performance, and then also a different um, kind of comparison to a different accelerator, which is called the IRS. Um, yeah, so... This is the conclusion slide, once again. Um, and um, now I would like to switch over to the actual paper discussion. Um, the paper discussion, I would like to uh, uh, structure in four parts. Um, I will start with strengths, then weaknesses, then uh, the outlook, and then the discussion. What I need to do. <laughs> mm. Okay, so if we look at strengths, the first blank of this paper um, that I've identified is this this uh, this this general layer level uh, study of the NN models, um, which in itself is is very novel. Um, it is the first quantification of interlevel variations within edge models compared to traditional ones, um, as well as across different model types. Right, because other studies um, had a tendency to rather only focus on one uh, model or they they uh, focused on traditional ones and not specifically these edge um, models. Uh, the mechanism itself uh, is very interesting, I think, because it kind of goes down to this layer granularity. Um, and on this layer granularity, you can find a lot of these actual, uh, these very um, interesting things that, that explain a lot of these shortcomings. Um, furthermore, the evaluation. Uh, I think what is good about this evaluation is that these um, layer clusters which are extracted have such a high validity so that they cover almost all the layers. I think it was super interesting, um, as well as that it demonstrated very well how the monolithic design was the root cause for these TPU shortcomings. So I guess this um, overall layer study of the NN models was one of the biggest things of this paper. The second strength um, identified was the Mensa multi-accelerator framework as such. So not the Mensa G, but the Mensa framework as such, um, which uh, is the first accelerated framework to actually exploit the computational memory um, heterogeneity of these models, um, specifically across a wide range and not just for a specific CNN model, for example, but across the entire range. Um, it was a very well-designed mechanism to overcome the shortcomings of, of the monolithical design. And if you read the paper, um, you will also see very nice design choices um, with regards to how it was structured. Um, 
I think it's also interesting because processing memory is an active area of research and it's going to become increasingly interesting. So I guess that's also a good area um, for the paper to, or a good direction for the paper to go into. Um, with regards to evaluation, once again, if you read the paper, you see that the implementation or, or the, the conceptualization of this framework is very practical with regards to its integration because it builds upon this already existing architectural uh, stack. So each heterogeneous accelerator is actually instantiated as a, as a normal Google TPU. And then this kind of reduces the burden for, for all the compilers as well as the programmers. So it's very practical in its implementation. Um, I also see a lot of application potential for this multi-accelerator framework um, beyond just edge devices. So if one, for example, thinks about how, how could this be implemented within data centers or um, process, other processing memory and processing and storage elements, how could these be incorporated together or, or what kind of synergies could be produced there, right? Um, and then um, we move on to the third one which is um, the Mensa G. I thought that was the third biggest strength is uh, its novelty. So first, obviously, because they came up with the framework, it's the first implementation of the framework. Um, but uh, yeah, I thought it was very interesting that they were able to reduce uh, the um, heterogeneous accelerators to a number of three, um, despite this very big diversity in, in uh, different layers. Um, once again, very interesting design choices, also with regards to the different data flows that were used to, to uh, kind of nail these three specific um, accelerators. Uh, and then finally, um, I, I mean, this is kind of self-explanatory. The evaluation was good because it was it, it achieved um, very good performance with regards to energy efficiency um, as well as uh, throughput. And then finally, um, the performance analysis of the Google um, Edge TPU was very well crafted and, and a comprehensive analysis. Um, it was a very straightforward application of analysis procedures and it, it very clearly identified the shortcomings. So overall, what you would expect from a good analysis. Um, if we look at the weaknesses, as the first uh, weakness, I have identified this performance analysis, because what I have, what I'm, well, first of all, it is a paper that was written for Google, right? So we have to mention the reproducibility as well as the transferability of these results because they were used, uh, they were, um, they were drawn using propri proprietary models as well as architectures. Um, while they say that publicly available models should uh, produce similar results due to similar characteristics, uh, it's obviously, uh, I guess one point that one just has to mention. Um, another thing that I was kind of lacking in this performance analysis is the weighting of the different NN models with regards to their um, importance as well as frequency distribution. Because if we analyze what kind of models and also what kind of layers within these layer families are employed on, a, on an average day, for example, on, on one of these Google um, Edge GPUs, and we maybe identify that most of them are CNN levels, then this bread and butter appro approach might actually be super well, and, and you, you don't even have these big inefficiencies, right? Because this model works very well, the CNNs. So I think this was a big issue that I saw with this paper, that we don't actually know how much these inefficiencies, um, in, uh, these model inefficiencies kind of uh, play out. And then this also goes in, in, in hand with the next point that um, with regards to where these Google Edge GPUs are actually employed, I think this also has an importance with regards to the significance of their inefficiencies, right? So if they're employed on a phone which is, is, has a much smaller battery, um, it, this inefficiency is much larger than compared, for example, for, uh, to a computer. And then finally, and I think this was also something that was mentioned in the last talk, um, we don't really know that much about the trade-off decisions um, that come into play in the design of such uh, Google Edge GPU models, because within this development, right, it might not be their goal to make the best model, which is the most efficient and, and the most uh, has the best throughput, but it might actually be to make a model that is very cheap or that works well with the already existing material. Um, so that is also something that one has to take in mind. Uh, if we move on to the Mensa framework, which is the second uh, weakness I've identified, um, is this kind of concept of future-proofness, um, particularly in light of new families and new um, uh, new new families that might emerge through new models um, that might indicate new accelerators that would be needed to um, be employed. So that is, I guess, a problem. While uh, the accelerator, while the model does 
um, account for some flexibility with regards to new models through this runtime scheduler. So they say even if new models um, come uh, are, are developed, right, we can um, just tell the scheduler where to map them to, so they account for some flexibility. But still, if, if a totally new model or, or mo a layer with new characteristic would emerge, we would have to integrate a new accelerator. And then we also, or I am also lacking um, insight into the runtime schedule overhead. So, so that is also, I guess, a question, um, not just how is the throughput of, of this uh, TPU, but actually how is the overall um, execution overhead. Uh, finally, we, um, the, the third weakness, um, I would like to go back to this layer study analysis, uh, where I just questioned if, if other models which were not within these 24 Google models, if they would also map into the same families. Um, and then again, also if future models would map into these. And then finally, um, once again, this frequency consideration of these different um, layer families. So this analysis of the, the Mensa G, um, it just kind of averaged it over all the models. But then again, we had a lot of uh, CNN models. We had only two transducers. So there is not that much um, frequency consideration within, within this averaged um, analysis. And then, um, but that is also something I would like to go into more with, with regards to discussion is the question of um, the Google, if, if this Google Edge TPU is actually a suitable baseline um, for such performance evaluations, or what would be the performance increase if we, for example, take a Google Edge TPU with better scheduling that actually accounts, for example, for these LSTM gates to uh, execute um, in parallel, or what if we compare it to a CPU performance? So kind of play around with these uh, metrics a bit and not just compare it to one and to the other. Although we have to say that the IVRS, which is the second evaluations, which I couldn't go into detail, um, they kind of use a different, less monolithical, more kind of block-based um, accelerator to compare it against. And then finally, um, the assessment is based on stimulated results uh, and not actual data that was being collected. So um, before we go into the discussion, uh, I think it's also interesting to look at the research question or the, the, the problem this paper is addressing in a larger context, um, which we'll call the outlook or um, the question, will edge ML accelerators remain important? And um, I think, and it's also maybe something we can discuss later, um, you could argue in both ways, right? Because um, ML is an increasing area, right? Um, privacy concerns are continuously coming up. We all want more connectivity, more uh, lower latency. What I think plays against it is, is this idea of uh, 5G, which actually might reduce latency. So there's a question of, can that kind of counter counterbalance um, these other forces? But I think overall, uh, this this uh, question is uh, likely to be relevant and um, likely to also become much more relevant as we see that these NN models increasingly um, become more heterogeneous, the more specialized they become towards specific edge devices. So we kind of see all of these four areas evolving and impacting the entire um, question. Now, with regards to alternative ideas and discussion points, um, first of all, uh, I thought it would be interesting to ask if this multi-accelerator framework is actually the best solution to solve this problem. Because we've identified, okay, um, a monolithic design is maybe not the best choice because it is very adjusted to certain things. Um, and then the paper also says that there is a different kind of accelerator, which I didn't have time to, to tell you guys about. But they say there's also such things called um, reconfigurable uh, accelerators, which do allow for some kind of reconfiguration, but not the entire co-design of the entire stack um, with regards to like one model or the other. Um, and it mentions that uh, this is, is good to some extent, but you have three main issues. And those would be that um, you're, not uh, you're not able to reconfigure everything specifically. So uh, for example, you can't reconfigure the buffer, right? If you have a big buffer, you have the high energy cost. There is no much thing that you can play with. Um, you also have to frequently reconfigure these, um, these, uh, this, this accelerator to employ it. So that is always an overhead. And then you can't actually kind of address, address this memory system um, because with the bandwidth, if we, if we put the accelerator into the, in, into, uh, near the data, we have a different thing versus if we put it um, close to or on the chip. So that is also a third um, problem. But what I thought in, in light of this, is there maybe a way that we can increase um, performance 
just, or, or if we look at the scheduling part, for example, if we look at the different gates, um, or if we look at a better memory footprint, right? Because we've just identified four, four megabytes um, when only 0.21 are being used is, is much too big. So what would be the impact if we take kind of the Google and then kind of uh, Google Edge TPU and, and create a Google Edge TPU 2.0, which maybe has a better footprint and a better scheduling, or maybe two um, heterogeneous PEs, um, or we do more uh, model aware prefetching. So if we know these specific parameters are being used, we kind of just fetch them in advance or these different concepts. Um, I thought that would be an interesting area to discuss with you guys. Um, if we actually really need these three specific heterogeneous um, accelerators that are being addressed, or if we could also kind of play with a block approach um, to this entire thing and then gain similar efficiencies. Secondly, um, what I thought would be interesting, um, and particularly we've heard in the last paper, that is the development of such TPUs takes a long time, right? Usually two years from until they're actually being employed. Uh, so what were the so if you now were to think about what are the future and end models that are being used on edge devices, what kind of things do we have to consider right now to to design these different um, layer families? And one thing that came up is, for example, recommender systems, which are being increasingly used on iPhone uh, on phones um, that have a very dense. Uh, layer, similar to CNNs, but then they also employ these um, embedded tables within the memory where they do a lot of memory intensive lookups. So we have another, a new kind of layer with new layer characteristics that might be um, also interesting kind of to, to design um, with that in mind. And then another point which uh, I thought would be interesting, especially with this, uh, with, with regards to Google, because if you look at these edge models which are being employed on, on the phones, um, they're usually a smaller version of these bigger NN models which are employed in data centers. And given that Google owns these models and owns the hardware, and then also owns the compiler in between, which makes takes this big model and produces a smaller one, it could also be interesting to analyze how do these compilers um, optimize this, this new edge model, right? So do they optimize for computational efficiency or do they optimize for, uh, for um, a smaller parameter footprint. And if we have access to this entire stack, couldn't we compute, uh, couldn't we um, com compile uh, these models specifically targeted at these hardware accelerators? So we don't actually need to change that much. We can just kind of compile these models in a different way. Um, and then finally, an interesting thing, um, which could also be explored is that the multi-NN execution, because for now, uh, these layers are executed sequentially. So um, that would also be an interesting thing to see how could that be implemented within such models that we can paralyze them even more. So yeah, that is, I guess, my talk for now. Um, and uh, yeah, I would love to hear what you guys think about it and your insights. Yeah. Uh, so what I was wondering is the grouping of the models is done by hardware analysis, like what resources are being used and, and how intensely. Um, and does that go hand in hand with the applications? Like, can you also group the models um, in the families that they are? Is that the same grouping as if you would group them by applications? And if not, could you maybe also um uh, get some ideas on how to um, create an accelerator if you group by application rather than by um, hardware resources um, yes i mean these applications uh, i wrote it down some i don't know specifically um but they're so these families are not specifically grouped by each application maps into this specific feature. But I mean, we've kind of established, right? We have these four different models and each has a different epic or serves towards a different application. And then within each model, for example, if you look at the um, RCNNs, which, which do these uh, video, for example, video captioning, they first do the, the um, analysis of, of uh, spatial features and then this temporal kind of memory. So they have the CNN part in the beginning and the LTS, um, the long-term short memory model in, in the end. So th despite this model, you kind of map into different families because the LSTM models are a different family then. So it's not like one model maps into, maps into one family, but rather, different sub layers of each model also yeah for example if you look at cnn models um those in the beginning for example map into a different uh, family than those rather 
at the end, or if you have a um, different channel and you do channel, um, like have a deep channel or something, they also map to different families. So um, that I think is, is more interesting, but you say like, so I guess designing the accelerator more aims towards these layers and not an application. So you just need to see what are the applications that are being used? How do the models solve these applications? And then how are these models different within kind of the, uh, so within layers, and then these layers can be mapped to the families. Okay. If that makes Thanks. sense. <laughs> no. You say that, that uh, the, in, uh, for example, one machine learning uh, model, there can be uh, different layers that uh, um, are uh, associated with uh, different mm -hmm. families. Uh, yeah. Uh, I am under the impression that uh, uh, moving this data around from uh, one uh, 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 from one layer to another would uh, create uh, yes. a huge uh, data traffic around the, in the chip. Yeah, that is actually um, a thing I, I didn't have time to go into, but if you look at the runtime scheduler, and it's a very naive runtime scheduler still, but what it does, it looks um, at... Yeah, it takes these two inputs, right? It takes the model characteristic, uh, the accelerator characteristics and the layer characteristics, and then it maps what would be the ideal accelerator to um, kind of employ it on. And then on a second step, it also looks what is it currently being employed on and what are the costs of, of kind of taking this data and bringing it to the new accelerator. So that is being taken into account through, throughout the scheduling. But um, it, the paper also says itself that this uh, scheduling is still quite naive and, and further better um, kind of runtime schedulers need to be developed in the future. Yeah, because I was uh, quite amazed to see a three time uh, uh, energy uh, efficient, efficiency improvement while uh, yeah, we are generating uh, this much uh, traffic around in the chip. Yeah, so. yeah. But then you also look at the different data flows, right? And um, if you see how the data is being moved, the you don't actually, because you place these, these um, data specific accelerators very close to memory, you don't need to move that much data around. Um, so the parameter we use is actually quite low. I think the only thing that will be moved around is, um, is these, uh, these um, output sequences, I would assume. Um, but I think if you, if you look at, and I, I don't actually know, but if you look at these different models, I assume that they can, the, these models, I think, kind of evolve more. Um, so if you go into so if you go into detail of how these different models um, can be reduced into these layers, you see that specific kind of layers, for example, CNN, I think, um, with large input channels, kind of map to this one characteristic and then uh, more shallow input channels to a different one. And then you can see that if you look at these models, they're very kind of like it's not there's not one model here then done with their one you know what I mean like I think they have a tendency but I think they have a tendency to kind of map into one area stay there for a bit and then kind of move over to the next one yeah okay thanks oh if that explained your question thanks uh, sorry again a question about that scheduler sorry yeah? if I didn't no understand problem. it correctly but it does doesn't like the scheduling always looks the same if if you um, run the same model or would it if it should more or less look the same couldn't I, you just ca calculate the optimal scheduling in advance and then as far as i've understood that actually happens no Uh, Geraldo, it's very hard to oh, hear. Oh, yeah, you don't. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Sorry. So I was just saying that it depends on some. So the runtime scheduler is, is runtime because there are some runtime decision that needs to be taken, and uh, particular for minimizing the data movement that was brought up before. Uh, for example, if you move, if you, if you, put some a computer center layer to a computer center accelerator, 
uh, and maybe later on you're going to have a memory centric layer, it may be better to keep the memory centric layer inside the computer centric layer, depending on how much data movement is going to be generated, instead of even though the memory centric layer would be benefit the most to the memory centric accelerator, instead of moving that memory centric layer to the accelerator, then pay for the data movement of moving the output of the CNN to the computer centric layer to the memory centric. Uh, computer centric accelerator to the memory centric accelerator is better to just map the memory centric layer to the computer centric accelerator in that case. So there, this type of runtime decisions that depend on the amount of traffic that is generated and the the proper uh, sequence of mapping that the layers um, the that is is executed that uh, would lead to different um, mapping across a particular uh, execution of uh, a model. So uh, hopefully it answers more or less your question. So yeah, that is an optimal scheduling, uh, of course, that uh, in ideal universe that like this traffic would not happen, like you don't have other models uh, that would, uh, would be performed. But in, in reality, when you are running, running, even though there is no ontology across different models, but when you are running a complex model, this type of uh, decisions of the sequence of the, of the mapping, uh, and particularly the traffic that is going to be generated by them uh, impacts uh, how you should uh, do the runtime. So uh, hopefully okay. more or less will so answer the question. Okay, thanks. And can I can I ask some? Yeah. One more thing: the the first discussion point that you had on the slide. Yes. Isn't this kind of the same question that we had in the previous? Um, previous presentation because it's basically when when like Moore's law doesn't work anymore is the only option that we have create um, like ridiculously particular hardware for exactly one task and this is kind of a good middle ground right we have like different subtasks that require different hardware features we use three maybe we could use four or five yeah yeah, um, like that's that's exactly what I thought. Um, if if we kind of need to get to this middle ground, right? Or if or if this is kind of over engineering, or that was my question: is is this potentially over engineering this entire thing, or could we also get similar results by kind of getting this middle ground between a mon very monolithic one and then a very very um, heterogeneous one? Can we kind of try to to develop this framework where certain things can be uh, very specific? also maybe specific to layers. And then we just maybe have one more or something where we put the rest or just kind of this, like how far do we actually need to go in this very um, heterogeneous direction or if we can kind of, and I think this paper also not, um, mentioned something which is called um, heterogeneous data flow accelerators, um, which do something similar. They also do um, heterogeneous accelerators, but they rather um, provide different accelerators with different data flow choices. So this data flow is good for different reuse patterns, right? And um, different parameters, uh, parameter access or footprints. Um, so, so my question was kind of how do we, how much do we need to go in this detail to get these efficiencies? Or is there a certain point where we can cut off and then make it eat simpler, the entire design, maybe also more cost efficient? Uh, kind of when 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 is there the tipping point you know all right yeah yeah a good question <laughs> i mean yeah it's probably okay. very hard to yeah have an accurate answer. so yeah that's what i was kind of thinking that um, i mean i like the idea of this scheduling but essentially you're just throwing more silicon at the problem and if you think about it basically all the time you're going to be only using third of your silicon um the two other cores are essentially not going to be utilized unless you're going to be doing some kind of parallelization i guess yeah, that's, that's the, the last that's one. the next step but in that case then you start running into issues like how do you solve the contentions between these cores so i i'm not sure that i'm very convinced i think i think it's just complicating it um uh, and as soon as you start like trying to have a complicated system um, and optimize it, you will start running into some unforeseen um, problems. Uh, problems. But nevertheless, it would be interesting to see how, how this works in reality. Have they done any kind of uh, analysis of uh, if this is uh, like in terms of, for example, silicon cost? Um, 
that's the paper states it's lower in cost, but it doesn't actually go into detail. <laughs> but probably that's also Google intern, huh? Yeah, so if you just account for like the total area for processing element array plus SRAM buffer mm -hmm. and, that, and the network that you require for the three accelerators combined, that is less than the baseline HTPU accelerator that we use. So in terms of like just silicon, is less silicon yes. for the for this particular mains edge implementation. Uh, but for sure, I agree with you that uh, when you... That is the problem of right now, you only run one model, right? Even though it may have many layers, it's still one single model and you run into this problem of just like using one third of your of your uh, silicon. Uh, there are solutions to solve this like power gating or something, but it's not ideal. So the best solution would be lever leverage that for multiple models at the same time. But of course this overcomplicates the model, but like, isn't like what, what we actually always do like, because think about like an auto folder core right now and the multi-core CPU. At some point for us to reach performance, you had to do that, right? So you have to like uh, run multiple programs at the same time and run multiple threads. So uh, depending on like the problem is, I guess, if the complexity of those um, machine learning models continue growing, uh, I guess the hardware eventually is going to have to catch up also in the complexity. So. Yeah, I guess it's good for us computer architects because we're going to have jobs in the future. Yeah, it's good that logic is free. Yeah. I think that is, uh, anyways, not up to question. Anybody else? Um, but yeah, but also maybe it could be interesting if, but I don't know if that's um, actually feasible, but if you say, okay, for example, we have a very LSTM intensive model, which mainly does uh, data centric um, acceleration. Uh, so we use that one. And then while the other one is being idle, which has a lot of Mac operations, maybe we can also use this framework to use other accelerations and then kind of use this idle thing because then we don't have the problem of um, data independent interdependencies because I think if we do two models at the same time, then there might be an issue with like switching up and then and these dependencies. So if we take that out of kind of the um, equation and say we run something completely different on the other accelerator, there could also probably be a lot of efficiency gains. Yep, thanks. Anybody else? Anything else? I think we're also a little over time. <laughs> Thank you. So thank you so much. Uh, I don't have, unfortunately, I don't have a slide for my mentors. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. <laughs> so thank you so much uh, for the presentation. And just some remarks about uh, when we were working on Google about this paper really quick. Um, it was a really big surprise for us about how much inefficiency uh, actually was uh, the HTPU was suffering, um, particularly on the memory subsystem. Um, when you are where we're doing the analysis. So I think the whole like means that you might be not perfect yet and the scheduler might still have a lot of problems to to overcome. But I guess the overall idea here is just like believe on heterogeneity. Like you can still uh, gain if you bank on that. And like in terms of cost and performance and energy efficiency, of course. So yeah, I think that is the whole takeaway. Thanks a lot. Thanks everyone for listening. Thanks a lot, Jacob and Lute. That was great. And thanks for uh, their mentors. So we still have uh, three more lectures. So see you next week. And don't forget to take the quiz for today. Yeah, all the best. <laughs>